we are on day two of IV. And I thought I was only gonna do two days of this, but honestly, given I didn't manage to cover everything I wanted for today's lecture. So I think I'm gonna stretch this out to three days. Um, obviously this is a ton of material and you could spend probably an entire semester just covering IV, honestly. Um, but we'll probably do one more day of it. So syllabus wise, everything will kind of get bumped by one day. Uh, maybe I'll mix things up a little bit, but um, so day two of instrumental variables. So roadmap for what we're doing. This is kind of just to give you a sense of, we're gonna be kind of moving around in different things just to give you a roadmap. What we're gonna do is sort of stay in this world of identification and think about you know, reiterating why it's easy to screw up the exclusion restriction and talk about two kind of simple examples where this shows up, um, which are pretty canonical in, in economics. Um, I'm really just trying to kind of beat this into you just to make sure, understand it and why it's potentially a problem. Um, then we're gonna talk about marginal treatment effects, which is kind of, um, you know, actually relatively new concept for me. It's not something I spent a lot of time learning in my classes, but so Ed Vitlissel here um, at Yale is kind of famously, this is one of the things that he worked on um, as, a, as a junior um, junior professor and has spent a lot of time thinking and working on. Um, then we'll talk about kind of this world of identification and um, these local average treatment effects and what the kind of rhetorical and philosophical concerns are about this. Then we're gonna just talk about a bunch of um, useful results, thinking about when IV is good versus bad. So what I mean by that is when can monotonicity fail, kind of how to think about monotonicity in more complicated settings and more generally um, IV. And we'll talk about characterizing compliers more generally. So let's just get started. So, um, and then, yeah, and then, in the next class, we're gonna talk about over-identification bias, uh, weak IV bias, um, quantile treatment effects with IV and um, lasso as well. So um, why is the exclusion restriction challenging? So, you know, one thing to basically, why am, I know another way you could ask this slide is, you know, why am I reiterating the exclusion restriction, given that we talked about it before, and this is obviously not the first time that you guys have heard this before. And it's it's this untestable feature of IV, right? So in this, in this DAG, it was this idea that Z is only affecting D or Y through D, that there was no other kind of um, additional variable that we had to worry about. And intuitively, the reason I'm pushing on this is because for so many folks for for such a long time, and even now, it feels like if something is randomly assigned or nearly random, that it should satisfy kind of this exclusion restriction as long as it also affects this D outcome. And this is just not sufficient for how you have to think about an instrumental variable and what's going on there. You really have to think critically about causally what's going on and what is kind of the shifter that um, is affecting you here. And so, I want you to kind of think about two examples that I'm hoping will kind of um, get you to think about this and kind of every time you see an IV now, this should be kind of the way that you think about what's going on. So basically consider two examples. So the first is going to be kind of this classic example that's used in a lot of the um, the Inbens and Angris examples that comes from Angris empirical work where he was thinking about using Vietnam um, War lottery numbers. So those of you who uh, don't have the historical background for this, in the United States in the Vietnam War, there was a compulsory draft. The compulsory draft stipulated that there were basically lottery numbers that were randomly assigned as a function of your birth date. You got your draft numbers. And if you had high numbers versus low numbers, that was going to basically make you, they sort of, those numbers were going to get cycled. Like you were gonna go up through the count. The higher your number was, um, kind of the, the less likely you were to be, to be called up or to be um, drafted. 
And so it was kind of a random assignment in that way. So a low number was going to make you more likely to be a Viet, um, in Vietnam, high number, um, same direction, uh, opposite direction rather. So you can think of this as binary. It can also be continuous. Binary is kind of the simplest way to think about it here. We're gonna do a lot of just discrete um, binary um, treatment, but a higher lottery number um, make you less likely to be a Vietnam vet, et cetera. And it was a randomly assigned lottery number. And so it's really design based. So it was, you know, think of this as you had a spinning ball, you know, spinning machine that was just gonna sort of randomly assign as a function of your birth date. You know, the fact that it's assigned as a function of birth date doesn't, you know, it's just a probabilistic measure in the sense that that's a way of allocating people. And we still have this probabilistic assignment. And, you know, obviously there's this question and that this seems like a pretty slam dunk IV in the sense that uh, should satisfy the exclusion restriction. It clearly affects veteran status. It's clearly random. Um, and, you know, it seems like it just should just be a good instrumental variable. And so this blurb on the right is from this Angus Imbens and Ruben rejoinder in the JASA and from their JASA article where Moffitt, Robert Moffat has a point on talking about the empirical example where he says that randomization makes the draft lottery by necessity an obvious and convincing instrument, um, italics ours for the effects of military service. In fact, and they're, that's sort of the quote um, that they're taking from Moffat's point. And what they're trying to say is the fact that economists do not make a clear distinction between ignorability and exclusion restrictions is evidenced by this incorrect comment. And so the ignorability point is the point that, you know, the randomization has made it such that we don't have to worry about there being confounders, right? Ignorability makes it such that we don't have to worry about that Z is correlated with the potential outcomes. But it's not obvious that exclusion is satisfied inherently. And so the separation of the exclusion restriction from the randomization is kind of the necessary point. So now we have this question of, well, does this necessarily satisfy the exclusion restriction? So not necessarily. And so what's one simple example? Being drafted could induce you to change your behavior to avoid the draft. So think about somebody who would be a never taker. So think of someone who would never go, would never go to Vietnam if they got a low draft number, or excuse me, a high draft number, meaning that they weren't gonna get drafted, then they wouldn't have to really worry, right? So they might just behave in a normal way. They'd go about their, their business. If they got a low draft number for that same person, they might decide to go and get their PhD because then they'll be in school for a much longer period of time and be able to avoid the draft. This was typically one of the ways in which you could avoid the draft. Alternatively, they might flee to Canada. They might flee to one of these places that's willing to basically harbor um, people who are dodging the draft. And so what is this gonna do? This is gonna induce a behavior change in some outcome that you're interested in that is independent uh, basically, you obviously didn't happen through the the outcome of interest. So Vietnam War. So the so I'm, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this. The outcome that they're interested in is mortality, and Vietnam veteran um, veteran veteran status is the treatment that they're looking at. Whether or not you're a vet is going to, um, in the sense that you ever went to Vietnam, is going to be the outcome that they the treatment that they're looking at, and. That's never going to change for these people, but obviously the instrument is going to violate the exclusion restriction and still have an impact on why if either of these things affect mortality in some meaningful way. So this is, you know, the this is exactly basically these non-compliers. The exclusion restriction is going to be essentially violated for the non-complier group in this setting. Now, there's a story that you could tell. Um, or you could kind of try and think about what, how big of how big is this, and what is you know how much of an issue this is, and that's what we're going to get into, of basically saying, well, how plausible is it this is going to substantially um, cause issues in our estimate for the local average treatment effect? Does that make sense? Is any I mean, can you think of other examples in this setting? There might be other cases too, right, where you 
where this doesn't have an impact, right? Kind of a, I mean, it's great that we kind of talked about a bunch of examples in the, in the draft case, because, you know, it's, I would say that if you have an example like that, like, it's still sort of interesting and you can get some really useful facts. It's going to sort of help us um, learn a lot about the Vietnam War status. However, what's interesting is we're going to talk about a second example where it's potentially a lot more challenging to believe the exclusion restrictions, but also a lot of papers are written using this. Um, and so, so there's been some papers that have considered rainfall as an instrument for income in agricultural environments. Um, so, you know, crops are heavily dependent on rain in a lot of, especially in a lot of developing um, countries and a lot of development contexts. And so Heather Sarsons has this paper um, in Journal of uh, Development Economics that talks about this. This is kind of a common thread. She's not the only one who says this, where there are papers and she's kind of highlighting papers that say, you know, conflict, people are interested in the relationship between conflict and income, especially agricultural income. And what they do is they use rainfall as an instrument for income in this context to then look at variation and conflict dr driven by potentially changes in income. And obviously the exclusion restriction is that rainfall has no effect on conflict beyond through the income channel. And so what Sarsons does, Heather Sarsons does in this paper is she shows that places with dams in India, which is basically help protect against the income shocks due to rain. So when there's too much rain, it helps prevent flooding upstream when there, there's upstream. And um, when there's not enough rain, the damming basically helps ensure that there's enough water when there's um, droughts. So it's basically a way of smoothing out these shocks. And basically what she shows in this paper is that um, those places have similar conflicts with dam those places with dams have similar conflicts um, to those without dams, which really suggests that, you know, the rainfall is having an effect on conflict that's not through the income channel, right? The income aspect, it just happens to be that they, they're correlated in that way. It's not that it's happening through income per se, even though income is affected by rainfall, um, it's not that the variation in income that is caused by um, rainfall then induces differences in conflict. And so basically the point is that it's plausible while rain is random, right? It's, a it's easy to imagine that like weather is effectively out of our control there's a lot of channels that rain has an impact on. And so the reason you might see, you know, an effect of rain on violence is, you know, uh, she talks about this is that basically, you know, it's plausible that basically what's happening is that rain basically depresses the ability to do conflict, right? When it's pouring out, nobody wants to hang out outside and like cause conflict. And so there's basically this point that, there's this correlation with the weather that's not being driven by income, which is a thing we wanted to vary, but rather through um, rather through these other channels. Um, does that make sense? So conceptually, potentially, this is obvious to you that you wouldn't want to use this, but there are a number of papers that have kind of used instruments along this dimension that it's really challenging to see how the instrumental variable would satisfy the exclusion restriction. Um, and there are some cases where maybe you're kind of just doing the best that you can in this and you're capturing a lot of things, but it's important to kind of highlight that there's maybe a number of um, problems with this. It's a number of things, I think like the more, this is a better example, this is why I used it, it kind of legal origins or kind of historical origin for those of you who work in development this kind of shows up a lot of like people want to use like the historical origins of countries for example and it's really challenging to see how that satisfies the exclusion restriction at all for something in the modern day given the number of things that that could be affecting it's kind of the same idea it's very challenging to write down basically a dag that looks like it would satisfy this um so let me talk about now this question that Alvaro had, which is basically this question of like, how do you, you know, what, how can we think about algebraically kind of what's going on um, with the exclusion restriction? And so, you know, even with a variable that's near random in its allocation, the exclusion restriction isn't always satisfied. And even worse, it's totally an untestable restriction in the sense that you can't test um, the exclusion restriction, you can do kind of, if you have an economic motivation, you can do like what Sarsons does, which is to say, look, 
we can test for something like a heterogeneity test that we think should be consistent with the channel that we have in mind. But, um, you know, that's not, if she had found the effect, it wouldn't have guaranteed that the exclusion restriction holds. It would have just guaranteed that, like, uh, it just, the failure to reject it is encouraging. It's support in its, in its direction. So using an IV basically really requires you to think carefully about justifying the exclusion restriction. Um, and, and so that's basically, you have to put on your cap to, you can't just use an IV and say, okay, now it's gonna work. You have to really um, hope that it's going to, you have to basically kind of defend it, especially in the context where you don't have real random assignment in a case where, for example, you're just using some kind of um, observational characteristic that you think will drive variation, you really kind of have to make sure that your exclusion restriction is satisfied. So let's kind of burrow into exactly kind of what's gonna happen in terms of the bias to sort of answer Alvaro's question. So we can have in the back of our minds exactly that never taker, basically um, Vietnam War shirker um, in, our, in our mind Basically, Angus, Imbens, and Rubin show that. So this is remember, this is that. Uh, this is basically that estimator that we would that we were going to do. Remember, it's the difference. So what we need to do if we want to sort of think about exclusion restriction being valid, we talk about our outcome, right? It now has two inputs because we haven't shut down the exclusion restriction channel, right? There's the direct effect of Z, and then there's the effect of Z through D. Right, so we did this initially, but we, we had shut it down because we'd said the exclusion restriction is satisfied. Call H basically the effect for, um, for, the, uh, for the exclusion restriction violation. Basically, um, da, da, da. sorry, just thinking for a second. So you can talk about H here being the effect that happens um, through the uh, always taker and and zero through the through the never taker, and what basically what um, AIR show is that if you take this estimand which we had talked about, it's it can it's basically two pieces. So it's the effect um, from the complier group. So it's the average effect of the instrument through the complier group. So there's this is you know. The reason HI looks like this is that it's going to be equal to for the compliers, it's always going to be that they move together, right? So Z is equal to one um, in this case, and, and it's equal to zero in this case, and DI is going to be um, in whatever direction the compliers allow for. So this would be the effect of both the treatment and of the instrument together. And then HI is going to be the effect for the non-compliers. And so to the, the point is that this is kind of the average effect that you'd have in mind. So there's potentially an effect that's gonna violate the exclusion restriction. This would be, for example, this first piece, so it's kind of Daniel's example. This would be kind of capturing that effect that um, Daniel had in mind. So there's both the treatment effect of Vietnam um, veteran status, but then there's also this impact that comes from um, changes in how you decide to be in the military, right? So for the complier group, they may also choose to kind of enlist in like a less risky unit, for example. Um, and the HI group, so this is, you know, the, this is the basically <clears throat> the conditional average effect for the non-compliers, the always takers and the never takers for um, the exclusion restriction being violated. So this is the bias basically coming from that. And the point, just the reason we wrote this out is that it's a function of two pieces, right? It's a function of how big is the effect of the exclusion restriction being violated? So is it a big effect? Like does moving to Canada or does going to school have a big impact? Multiplied by basically the relative ratio of non-compliance to compliance. So what's cool about this is that as the share of compliers gets really, really big relative to the non-compliers, this is less and less of an issue, right? So that's interesting. Like that's a useful, this is gonna come back to basically be relevant when we talk about this, when we talk about like weak IV and other things that 
this denominator, if this is very small, then you, it really blows up the effect. And that kind of makes sense, right? The point is, is like we get this thing and then we have this bias piece and the bias is really going to contaminate it a lot if the people who are biased are a big share, like their average effect is a big component, they're big and they have a um, big effect, then if the compliers are small, then that's going to have a big, um, bigger impact. So this, the a one, the, basically the big takeaway that I want you to have is that if the exclusion restriction is violated, the stronger your instrument is, kind of the less of a concern it is. One kind of um, follow-up thing to this is that, that oh, that's exactly this. The, the key point is that the larger the complier group, the less the bias from the violations and exclusion restriction. And one kind of nice fact um, in the paper, and you can see the paper for details for just sort of how it's derived, but this just comes from kind of rearranging, is that if the effect, the exclusion restriction effect is additive, when what I mean by that is that if, the effect for the, um, so the zeros, remember, these are the never takers and the ones are the always takers. If the effect of the exclusion restriction is the same, basically if it, it's not correlated with what your veteran status is. So if you, if you never, if you don't take it, the difference between the two of these is the same as that um, if, you, if you took it, it's an additive effect for a given person, then what you can show is that the S demand that when we do IV is that it's literally exactly the IV that we want. So this is rather than being this piece that has the buy, like the, the, the effect that Daniel was worried about, that it's equal to exactly the IV late. So we're gonna shut down the exclusion, the IV that we wanted, which is um, you know the piece where you shut down uh, the impact from Z plus this bias piece where you're scaled by the share that are compliers. And so this is exactly making this point directly that when it's additive, then you would get exactly what you want plus this bias piece. And that piece, the smaller the piece, the bigger the compliers are as a share of it, the smaller that bias is. Let me pause there. I know there was a lot of complier and non-complier and everything else. The, this is the real point that I just want you to take away is that there may be cases where you can't really test if the exclusion restriction is violated, but the exclusion restriction violation is always going to be a bigger problem. The kind of the bigger the effect is that you are worried about from it being like the, you know, whatever the exclusion restriction effect could be. So if it's bounded in some way mechanically, then it's less of a concern. And it will be a negative function of how large the complier share is. And remember, this is a known, we can know this. The share of people who are compliers is knowable. We talked about this last class and we're gonna talk about it again. The complier share is literally the first stage coefficient. This is from their JASA paper. So this is from their 1996 JASA paper. Okay, so now let's, so we're gonna pause there. So we were talking about um, local average treatment effects in the context of monotonicity, um, this Angus Imben's uh, Rubin setup now what we're going to do is we're going to come back to, if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it's been more than that now, like a month ago, we were talking about um, this idea that there's an underlying latent index model for thinking about the choice of treatment. And what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be using that in the um, IV setting to actually think about the economic model of how of treatment choice. And so this is coming from Heckman and Wittlesel's um, 1999 PNAS paper. They have a number of papers on this topic, um, but we're gonna focus on, on this particular one, this particular setup. What this paper basically does is we go back to this world of thinking about an underlying treatment decision. So we have some D star for an individual where there's some net utility gain from choosing to do something. So there's a mu D, so it's mu one or mu zero, depending on if you choose it or not. Um, conditional on your, basically your instrument Z, and then some uh, random utility draw. So this is the utility draw D um, for choice uh, for person I. And then D is gonna be equal to one if that's above some threshold. So the threshold's uh, zero. 
So the point is, is that every person kind of has like this underlying epsilon randomness. And then they also have this underlying, um, oh dear, did I, oh, I didn't change that back. That is very annoying. Okay. So just, this is gonna be really confusing. I'll change this in the notes so you guys have this. This is, I'm gonna write this on the board behind me so you can see it. I found it really confusing because they run around. So it's di star is equal to mu uh, d zi minus u d i. So this is just a u rather than an epsilon. Because I was I'm using epsilons for these other things. So then it's about if u di is um, correlated with epsilon one, epsilon i, this will cause sorting. So idea here is that, so this is, I'm just changing that first epsilon into a u. It's just, I forgot to change that back. Um, so the potential outcomes is the same potential outcome setting. We have yi, it's gonna be equal to yi one if di is equal to one, yi zero if it's not. We're gonna plug in for yi one, we're gonna call yi one this mean function here, which is a function of this epsilon i one. And mu zero is a function of this epsilon i zero. And usually, you know, obviously you could have characteristics, but I'm just omitting it for notational simplicity. So the idea is just like, look, you have some function. When you choose to do it, you get some outcome. And when you choose not to do it, you have some other outcome. Um, your choice of it is going to be a function of obviously the, the, the outcomes in, in both scenario. And then you have this underlying UDI where those could all be potentially correlated with one another. So the point is that some people choose to be allocated into something because it's worth it for them. So if we think about, forget about any IV, this is exactly the type of problem we worry about, right? Is that the people who are choosing to do something, those are the ones who benefit the most from it. So that's what this model is going to do. It's gonna be basically a switching model where on the margin, what you're gonna have is if you hold everything fixed, is that there's going to be essentially a set of people such that if you think about who's going to choose to have di equal to one and di equal to zero, it's gonna be a function of these three random variables, right? The epsilon i1, epsilon i0, and epsilon di. So if we hold fix zi, the choice of epsilon di, or not the choice, the draw of epsilon di is gonna exactly identify who chooses um, di equal to one versus not, right? So this is this first point, is that the propensity score, so this P of z, it's really this function, cumulative function of your mu d uh, zi. So it's basically inverting this function. And so you can define a random variable, which is literally just the cumulative um, CDF of the underlying U, right? So why am I saying that? So take this DI star, um, DI star is equal to mu D Z um, I minus U D I or U D, yeah, I. The point is, is that remember when this is greater than zero, that's when di is equal to one. And so the, sorry, let me switch the camera. My son stole my black pen. So I don't know where they are. So it's in brown, I'm sorry. Um, so the point is, is that there's basically a crossing function, right? This is an index such that if we hold fix Z, mu D doesn't change based on people and we have some draw. And so basically if we have, here's the distribution for U D I is that if for U D I greater than uh, mu D Z I, right? That, the 
for everybody to where it's bigger, these people are going to choose di equal to zero, and these people are going to choose di equal to one, right? Does that make sense? So the thing, the point of it is to say, well, this is a random variable. And so it has some cumulative function that looks like this, say. And so what you can talk about is we talk about some utility, which is equal to the cumulative function of UDI. Now, that's sort of conditional on a given value of z, right? I mean, so conditional on a given value of z, this exactly defines this, this value um, of u star is going to tell us kind of where you fall in the propensity score distribution. OK, so what's cool about this, I know it isn't apparent yet, but it gives a nice way to think about IV because we're going to now have this way of thinking about who are the people who are getting moved as we shift around things. Already, hopefully, it becomes clear that Z, by the way that we set it up, only affects the outcome by moving around who are the people here, right? So by moving Z such that mu D goes to the right, you're going to induce more people to have DI equal to zero or vice versa going in the other direction. So it's basically changing people on the margin who are going to um, be induced to change their choice of, of DI. So that's the exclusion restriction. It's baked into the way that we've modeled this. We're basically assuming some nice like smoothness for the errors that need to be absolutely continuous. And then we're basically getting random assignment of these, of these Zs. OK, cool. All right, next, there's a lot on this page. So in this, basically now what we can do is we can consider a number of estimates given this setting that we just did. First, let's just call this capital delta. This cap delta is the, this is the potential, this is basically the treatment effect, right? The individual level treatment effect. And so of course, what we can talk about is the average treatment effect for everyone. So this is the ATE, which is what we'd like to estimate. And if it was randomly assigned, we could estimate for everyone. That's easy, right? It's just the expectation of this. We could talk about the ATT, which is the same thing, but conditioning on treated, right? So that's straightforward. And finally, well, not finally. Next, what we can do is we can talk about the late, right? So remember how we defined our late. So what we're going to do is we're going to be, um, saying it's you know, the outcome for Y conditional on our choice of Z, the probability of Z and Z prime, and then scaled by the propensity score, right? So now what this is basically going to exploit is it's going to exploit the fact that, so effectively, just based off of conditional expectations, right? That this first term, this is, I mean, this is what we did when we did estimation, is that the first term here is equal to these two pieces together, right? So there's the probability um, of ZI equal one. So if DI is equal to one, this is just the two of these together. This is just um, the conditional expectation. You've pulled it, pulled it out. Um, and with probability one minus P, it's, oh, dang. Sorry, this should be a uh, typos. This should be a Y zero. So, oh, did I, man, I'm sorry, guys. This is what I get for having too much notation. So that second term should be a Y, Hopefully it's clear that that should be a, a Y zero, right? Because the point is, is that for with probability, this is the probability that D is equal to one. This is the probability that D equals zero. This is the out, potential outcome when D is equal to zero. And this should be D equals zero as well. So what you're getting here is basically the outcome for a given one is basically um, the relative mixture 
of the treated and untreated um, within that context. Is that clear? Sorry, I know it sucks to have typos in the notes. I'll fix it and post the new ones. Basically, this is DI1, this is DI0, this should be Y0. And then the point is, is that you can write that as, you know, the first fundamental theorem of calculus says, well, those are just integrals, right? So, right, from zero to PZ of this for U tilde equals to U. So remember that this is just an integral. Remember the U tilde is the probability of um, the probability of being treated at a given point. So, given a conditional value, given a conditional value of z, that this is basically the probability of being treated at any given point. And so, what it's doing is it's integrating from zero up until this first probability of the treatment effect for um, the, the treated. And then for everybody from PZ up to one, this should be a Y zero. It's basically treating all those ones on the, on the right. So another way of saying this is remember how we fixed a given value here. The idea is to say, remember, we know that all these people are DI equals zero and these people are all DI equals one. And so if we integrate over the whole distribution of UDI, well, we know that these people will all be yi1, and these people will all be yi0. Let me switch this back, sorry. So, you know, whatever this cutoff is, where this is the probability of z, remember, between this group and this group, we're going to be integrating over the people who would have taken it. And over these people, we were, we're going to be integrating over those who wouldn't have taken it for a given value of z. And so as a consequence, that's just one of the terms. That's the first left-hand term. Sorry, this left-hand term. And then you're taking the difference at a different z. So what you're going to do is now shift z, take that integral. And so what you'll be doing then, sorry, this is a lot of things written down. What you'll be doing is comparing two sets of individuals. You'll be comparing those who had, so there's the PZ and then there's PZ prime. These people will have their value, these are the compliers. And these are the people who are gonna be shifted from being YI1 to yi0 under this model. And that's what this difference is doing. So then this was for a given one of the PZ values, and then we do the difference of the two of them. And that's going to get us exactly the difference um, in the integrals where this should be yi0. That's a lot, I think. So let me pause there. Is that clear, at least intuitively, what's going on? This is basically a way of framing the same thing that we said for the lates, namely who the compliers are. But the idea is that there's kind of a distribution of types of people who would sort into being either the people who take the program or don't based on some unobservable. And the point of this Z is what it's doing is it's shifting who the marginal people are. Which is cool, because like we write down, I mean, I don't, but people do write down models in which they think about there being this kind of smooth, continuous distribution of people who choose. There's a marginal person. So, right, so these people are kind of on the margin for a given value. And we can now think about this late as saying, okay, well, this late is kind of well defined for any two points, but that's kind of like a, a discrete difference. So, what if we took the limit? and let the difference go to zero. So that's what um, this PNAS paper calls the local IV, eventually ended up being called the marginal treatment effect, where all you're doing is really just taking the limit of these two points right until they converge. And so it's saying, all right, well, what is the treatment effect, the delta there as I let that limit go to zero? Which is cool. I mean, that is a really powerful way of thinking about stuff. Um, 
So each S demand now could just be considered um, an integrating up of these underlying local effects. These underlying local IVs are now the basically the summing up of these underlying pieces. So, you know, we already talked about this local IV piece. So that's for a given PZ. So we fixed PZ now. You know, that is really just saying that like, what's the expectation at that point? So for the U, for these people who are right on the margin, you know, who, who had a UD, uh, a UD draw such that they're exactly indifferent. If we shift them in treatment, what's the effect look like? That's what the local IV will give us. The average treatment effect is just saying, okay, well, imagine we just integrated over everyone. That makes sense. That's exactly what we'd want. Um, the, uh, the average treatment effect on the treated, this is sort of, I, I've never totally understood the fascination with this, but um, you can first say like conditional on a given value of an instrument, what's the average treatment effect on the treated? And that's obviously just basically saying like, let's uh, integrate the local IV up over the different pieces, but then scale it. So we're really, what we're doing is we're saying like, let's integrate it up over just the people who would have been treated, but then scale it appropriately. So moving from zero up to PZ. Um, and then, yeah, so that's for a given value of PZ. And then obviously um, you need to rescale that piece. You need to integrate that one up over the values of the instrument. Um, the local average treatment effect is hopefully obvious. I mean, so basically we did this here. We sort of drew what's happening. This is shift. And then what you're doing is you're just accounting for the size of the integram. So the point is, is we're going from PZ to PZ prime. Well, then you want to adjust for the fact that you're only moving over um, a small increment in order to get kind of the average effect for those people. And that's why we divide by the difference in um, the difference in the propensity scores. So, you know, that's pretty powerful. There's basically this point that we can think about all of these being built up as this underlying um, index model where there's a set of people, we put them in a row as a function of their desire or intent to do this. And, um, you know, if we think about shifting the incentives to participate in a program, the local, the treatment effects then are going to be integrating over the marginal treatment effects of the compliers. So, That's great. There's kind of a large literature on this that I'm only touching on right here. I think there's a couple of points that I want to highlight here. Um, formally, you can actually estimate the marginal treatment effect. So what you do is you would fit the outcome Y on functions of the propensity score, right? So imagine you estimate the propensity score for different values of Z. So you'd have to have a lot, you know, say Z is some continuous valued function and you can estimate it for lots of values then you could fit Y, you could take the, you know, it's a conditional value of E, a conditional expectation of Y on those different values of the propensity score, you'd map that out. And then you take the derivative. And formally, right, you can see exactly, sorry, you can see how that happens here, right? So if we estimate the function Y at different values of Z, that'll give us this. And then we take the derivative with respect to the propensity score, that gets us exactly the marginal treatment effect. So you can plot that. So like, it's a cool thing. Like this is a, a very, I mean, Stata will do this for you automatically if you want. Um, you, the trick with it is that you need a lot of values to the instrument. So you can't do this with a binary instrument, right? So you can see hopefully why, like with a binary instrument, there's no such thing as a, a derivative. There's just first, there's just differences when you have just some binary um, instrument. And even with a discrete instrument with like three values, you have to make kind of an approximation argument to have any real functional, um, to have kind of derivatives exist, right? You'd have to make a statement that you're gonna get more and more values. So that makes sense. I mean, that's the same thing we do when we put our models in place, right? We kind of make assumptions that there's gonna be derivatives that exist, et cetera, um, but it's worth highlighting here. Um, so once you start thinking about it this way though, so like say Alvaro did this, is that you could have this and you could talk about like, well, what is the, the local average treatment effect in different places? Like, what does it look like? 
um, you could reweight and construct other types of sort of policy relevant treatment parameters and kind of talk about what the curves look like. And a lot of this view in this MTA, MTE literature, I had managed, I had planned to like kind of, we'll talk briefly about it. I was gonna kind of really get into the guts of like the kind of fighting that happened over this. It's a little bit what we talked about at the beginning of the semester where I sort of, we had several classes where we talked about why people think design-based inference is good versus bad and kind of research design. IV has kind of been a hot point on this and specifically late and MTE has been viewed as potentially a slightly better building block because it, the view is that it kind of really ties into some economic model. This idea of the marginal person who will be shifted by a policy is potentially really um, satisfying for a person who's thinking about a model, like a structural model um, and estimating a structural model. Um, and the worry is that maybe a late is not a policy relevant piece of information because it reflects some kind of self-selection choices of a particular group. Um, so, great. So let's just kind of pivot there a little bit here to, so, you know, is late great? So there's this idea that, you know, I hopefully have made it clear that IV can be really good if it's done correctly, right? It can give us a very internally valid estimate of what's going on. And so, you know, that's good. You want to have things that are true. Something that's internally valid is better than something that's not internally valid. Um, the concern that people have is that external validity is worrisome. So in the late case, you know, is there something special about the range between PZ prime and PZ, right? In this marginal treatment effects, who are these people? There's something special about them. And is that informative for the kind of policies that we care about? The types of people who are shifted on the margin, are they really informative for broader economic policies that we care about? And, you know, the kind of the joke, this is a cartoon of just the joke, it doesn't need to be here, is that it's right. It's like, I'm looking for my quarter that I dropped. Did you drop it here? No, I dropped it two blocks down the street. Then why are you looking for it here? Well, it's because the light is better here. And it's like, you're looking at the criticism of late is you're just doing it because you think it works. Like you can actually do it here. But what we care about is something, you know, the quarter that's down the street. And so there's no reason to be focusing on the late. That's the criticism. Um, you know, one thing just as a caveat before I pivot to the sort of my view on part of the defense of this is that a lot of the criticisms here are kind of confounded with the issue that IVs are poorly used. So this exclusion restriction. So, you know, I think we gave a number of good examples in which IV are poorly used. I think the weather example is kind of one where it's really problematic, but there's a number of other ones that are of varying degrees. And so there's this concern that like, there's a version of this in which this is done extremely well versus one where it's done poorly. Um, and so it's important to kind of keep those uh, debates separate. So the question is, is if you do this correctly and you understand the criticisms is sort of late good. So Hito and Memphis is very famous um, JEL response piece where he says better, better late than never or better, better late than nothing. Um, and, you know, the, the point of it is, and I'm not going to summarize his debate correctly, but it's certainly my view is that a well-identified design gives us a real set of facts. You know, we can debate the merits of every design, but at least you establish kind of what is the gold standard of what you'd like to do and understand kind of the caveats of the work that you're doing. The concern for, you know, that I think some researchers have is that, oh, well, for the setting that I'm interested in, it's just impossible to get any real research design in play. Like, oh, I can't do it. Like in the 90s, when people were pushing for these sort of things is, oh, well, I can't run these kinds of experiments or, oh, I can't find this kind of variation that's going to be relevant for what I'm looking for. Um, you know, for the finance people in the audience, this is like a constant refrain amongst finance people that just like drives me up the wall. Um, so you're not going to hear me complain about finance for a second in the sense that labor people 25 years ago were saying, oh, we're never going to find any kind of real variation to estimate things. And then they've managed to find many sources of identification um, relevant relative to say corporate finance. So there's a question of, you know, it may be that it'll be challenging the hope is that, you know, creative researchers can find good examples in many places and then try and use it in innovative ways um, 
to speak to the kind of questions that we're interested in, the kind of counterfactual questions that we're interested in. I will say that the other big thing is that for structural folks, I think the big problem is that, you know, there's they're interested in counterfactual experiments that are perhaps just not um, doable in the kind of experiments we have. And one thing that's been very nice in structural methods has been trying to kind of incorporate kind of exper uh, you know, RCTs or IVs that we think are credible into these structural models. So sufficient statistics in um, public finance has been one approach, which is trying to basically get causal parameters that then let us talk about other types of um, counterfactual questions. You know, more generally, just the idea that, look, we're going to get some estimates, they're going to be reduced form, and then they're at least informative for the model that we're going to put in place. We're not going to calibrate it in kind of totally arbitrary ways. We're going to try and discipline the kind of broader structural things that we're going to do. The key point in the end is using poorly identified estimates is there's no reason that that's better. That's like not better. In the end, what you get is just a total lack of clarity in terms of what's causal and what's not. And people can just pick based as a function of their prior. And really in the end, the point of this late literature is it's useful because it's highlighting what's knowable without adding more assumptions in place. That's really what I want you to take away from this is kind of what can we know given the kind of assumptions we're willing to make? If we're gonna make more assumptions, let's just make them. That's what we did in the difference and difference setting, but at least we made it explicit. Anyway, that's my rant session um, for five minutes. Um, now let's use the last chunk of class, last 15 minutes, kind of talk about um, cool things you can do to talk about the compliers. So, uh, you know, this is the kind of negative way of viewing who are the compliers. Oh, we're worried that they're special. An economic model says maybe there's something like, you know, if you, it's important to kind of keep in mind, right? Like the whole point of these latent index models is that they highlight the fact that the people on the margin are going to potentially be very different types of people than the types of people who are not getting shifted by the instrument. So the, so, you know, the complier group is going to be special in the sense that they are marginal by definition. And so maybe what we can do is try and understand who those compliers are a little bit more. And that's what we're going to be able to do um, in the next couple of slides. First, let's just briefly talk about um, monotonicity because I, we avoided it for a while. We mainly talking about exclusion restriction. I want to kind of highlight a few cases in which monotonicity can fail. So first, this is kind of always a useful, um, I just keep this in, in your mind. Remember who the four groups are. There's four groups. There's, um, this is basically the way that we think about the effects, right? So there's the never takers. They're the ones who, irrespective of, um, what the instrument is, their, their treatment is always going to be zero. So remember the YI is the first input is the instrument value. The second input is the, the treatment D. So the never taker, they never take, um, their effect is basically the same irrespective of um, the treatment and the exclusion restriction is satisfied. So there's no impact. The def uh, well, let's, let's do the always taker next. So the bottom right, so they're always gonna take the treatment and the instrument has no impact. And so there, there's no difference between the two. You can't estimate the effect using the, um, using the instrument. And then the compliers, they're gonna be the ones who, when the instrument is one, they're gonna take the treatment. And when the instrument is zero, they're not gonna take the treatment. I've ordered it in a particular way. And then the fire is the opposite. And so the problem is, is that they get the negative value of what their individual treatment effect. This is just from that same JASA paper by um, Angus Imbens and Rubin. So what are some examples to keep in the back of your mind of failure of monotonicity? So it's always useful to have failures of monotonicity to kind of keep in the back of your mind. So here are three examples. This is from Dishes Martin's um, uh, quantitative economics paper. So the first is in examiner designs. And we're gonna actually talk about this in a much more full-throated way in, in a week or so. Um, but here, we're, let's just imagine we have two judges. So Leland and Azahan are our judges and Leland is very lenient and Azahan is very strict. And so, you know, we go before them and we're gonna randomly assign them. And so Daniel shows up. If, he, if he's the kind of person who, whom if he gets Azahan, 
he's going to be basically found guilty. But if he, he's assigned to Leland, then he's not guilty. He'll be a complier in that setting in the sense that there's a variation then in the guiltiness that's induced by which judge is going to happen. And we could use that guilty then the treatment of the guilty outcome on some other outcome, right? So that would be kind of assuming Azlahan and Leland have no impact above and beyond just through the guilty, um, guilty or not guilty decision. So the key thing here though, is that then if Aaron shows up, or if David or if Rosie, all these people showing up, it always has to be that Azahan is always stricter than Leland. Irrespective of who shows up, it always has to be that this ordering is preserved. And so it's easier to envision failures of this. You know, you could have different types of crimes. There could be preference for certain types of groups of people, et cetera, in which what will happen is, is that we may say, we'll see that on average, the propensity score for Leland is lower than Azlehan. So on average, <clears throat> she's stricter, but there might be some subgroups where monotonicity is violated. So examiner designs are really challenging. Um, this is kind of a really a budding literature. I'm working on some stuff right now, trying to think about this. I've done a paper using judge designs. Um, <clears throat> this is just a problem that people are working on. Um, I think it's still very nice. Obviously, without heterogeneous treatment effects, you don't have to worry about this. But in, when you have heterogeneity, it can be a problem. That's case one. Um, case two is this really kind of interesting example from um, Angerson Evan. I think it's Angerson Evans, actually. Um, they have this paper thing using sibling sex composition as an instrument for, um, for having a third child and the impact that that has on uh, female labor force participation. So basically what they're exploiting in the fact that is that, you know, if I have uh, two, two kids of the same sex, then on average, I'm more likely to have a third child. There's just this preference for having um, a boy and a girl for whatever reason. Um, and that makes sense. On average, you see that empirically. It's a testable um, implication. But the problem is that for some families, they could want just two boys or just two girls. And so what will happen is that what it could be then is that if you're one of the subsets of families that feels that way and you want two boys, then if you had two boys, you're not going to have a third child. But if you had a boy and a girl, then you are going to have a third child. And you're by definition going to be a defier. And so, of course, then the question becomes, okay, well, what is that going to imply about our potential um, late that we estimate? And then finally, this is kind of a, a very simple one. This is almost a version of what we did with the, um, the Vietnam War example is encouragement design. So an encouragement design is the kind of thing where example, I want Daniel to take up, Daniel gets said a lot because he shows up on the top of my, my canvas thing here. Um, it, basically you have a nudge where you say something like, go invest in your 401k, it's really good for your um, retirement. You do mailings and you randomize who gets mailings and who doesn't. The hope, what you're going to instrument, what you're trying to instrument is to invest in your 401k. And then we look at some subsequent outcome, like retirement income. What can happen is that if you're very heavy handed in your encouragement design, the defiers thing could basically, what it could happen is that you would have done it, but then you got this really over the top uh, messaging that induced you to kind of switch in the other direction. I think it really depends on the context, but you worry about this, for example, in like political situations. So I've, I've, you know, recently run an experiment where we were trying to induce like COVID behavior, like changes in COVID behavior. And so then you worry like, well, if I message people and I get, and because things are particularly partisan, if I message in a particular way, am I going to induce people to, to kind of behave poorly because they got a message from people who look like, you know, uh, aristocratic, um, academic elites, right? So there's this concern about some kind of heavy-handed messaging that's going to that's going to do this. So all of those could cause monotonicity violations. And you know there are papers. So there are a bunch of papers that attempt to characterize alternative assumptions instead of just pure monotonicity. And those might work better for your application. So the two that I list here is is um, Dishes Martin has this tolerating the fires paper. Franzen and all have this judging judge fix effects paper where they talk about average monotonicity. The end point is that this is like not a solvable problem. This is kind of like the problem with these types of results is like, 
there's a fundamental mismeasurement problem when you have defiers there because you have this mixture of two types of people and you can't differentiate who's who. Um, any solutions to this really have to add other assumptions on top of it to get something that works. And those solutions are going to be situational. So I, you know, you just have to be aware that there are going to be potential problems uh, that are going to happen there. And what might happen, for example, is maybe you're just interested in the reduced form in the end. Like you could just estimate. So in our case with the messaging, rather than instrumenting, we could just say, all right, well, we'll just look at the effect of the message. It might induce behavior in the wrong way, but that's kind of the treatment we care about anyway. Um, does that make sense? Any questions on that? Hopefully that's clear. Okay, so IV kind of generally, we've been talking a lot about 2SLS as this particular way of studying this. Really kind of IV is a really a tool for estimating the causal impact of something to generate variation in some policy that you're interested in using an instrument. And I just want to highlight this is a kind of a nice setting where you think about it is like, for example, if you have a diff and diff that's inducing some variation in a policy, for example. So say you have a diff and diff for DIT, where you have some variation in the diff and diff that then you can use as the first stage for a causal estimate. So basically the point being that you have something that looks like basically to SLS, but what you're exploiting is the assumptions in diff and diff that is what's called fuzzy difference in differences. So Deshaies, Martin, and Dautfoy have a, a paper about this. And basically you need some additional assumptions to hold because you obviously need, now you got two juggling sets of uh, um, identification assumptions. But what's really nice is that then you can kind of get this structural parameter that you're interested in, which is going to be you know the causal effect of D on Y, and you're going to get variation that comes from this um, diff and diff kind of treatment variation. And so this is also going to, so this is this fuzzy diff and diff is what the um, Deshaies Martin and co call it. There's also this note by Sally Hudson, Peter Hull and Jack Lieberson um, on Peter's website, which is also thinks about this. Um, and this is cool. Like this is a useful setting for thinking about kind of point being that IV is just going to induce variation. And so there's a lot of settings where you might be able to get this kind of variation. Um, this fuzzy label, and, you know, the ordering came in the other direction. This fuzzy label is going to come up also when we do RD, for example, RD regression discontinuity, you can have fuzzy regression discontinuity, which is exactly the same thing as IV, but you're going to be exploiting the variation that comes from your RD design to get instrumented variation. Okay, in the last six minutes, what we're going to do is talk about what can we know about compliers. So we talked a little bit about this already, but I just think this this is like very cool and I think is underused by people who are using these types of approaches. Um, what's interesting is that under the assumptions from late, so exclusion, first stage, monotonicity, we can actually know a lot more about the compliers than you might think. So a lot of this work comes from work done by um, Alberto Abadi. And basically, if you think about a binary, um, for, a lot of this stuff needs to be binary for the um, this to work, although you could put some additional structure on it and still back this stuff out, is that so if your treatment is binary, then remember that the difference in propensity scores is exactly the complier share. So we talked about this last time in class. I said something like, how do you know how many people are instrumented? And the way to see this is that so the probability that you're a complier, so that means that if you're instrumented that the DI value is greater than DI zero, well, that's equal to this, right? The expectation of the difference, which is under the random assignment assumption is just equal to the difference in the propensity scores. And what's cool is we can even know who are the share who are treated of the compliers. So, or so, sorry, let me say it a different way. So conditional on being treated, what share are compliers? So the way you do that, right, is using Bayes' rule, so you just swap the order, the probability of DI equals one, conditional on being a complier, times the probability of a complier, scaled by the marginal. Nice thing is, is remember that the probability DI equals one, conditional on being a complier, well, that's the same thing as your instrument being equal to one. Then you multiply that 
by the probability of being a complier scaled by the probability of being di1 well that's just this so what it's saying is that the um the sh com the probability of being complier conditional on being treated well that's equal to the share of compliers multiplied by the probability of the instrument being one over the probability of being treated and so obviously if the first stage is perfect then they just you know these would just be the same um but this is basically going to let you talk about both the share of compliers and the share of compliers amongst the treated here. Second, we can actually also know about the average characteristics of compliers using the same logic. So imagine we have some discrete characteristics. So it could be, you know, it could be multi-valued and then you're just looking at the share within each bin. But imagine we have some binary thing like uh, gender or sex. So we have the probability of some outcome. So X equals one, for example. Well, conditional on being a complier, what's the probability of X? Well, by Bayes' rule, again, it's the probability of being a complier conditional on X multiplied by the marginal, scaled by the complier probability. Remember, we can just plug in for this piece, right? So this probability of being a complier conditional on X, well, that's just equal to the difference in the first stages for the X group multiplied by the marginal scaled oh this is a typo this should not have an x in it these should not have x's here on the denominator this should just be the overall because what will happen is, is that then if we just what compared the probability of x condition on being a complier scaled by the probability of x well that's literally just the difference in the first the ratio of the first stage coefficients right if you take the ratio of the first stage coefficient for x equals one and then you compare it to the overall that'll be the relative difference in how much, say, men are in the complier group versus the overall distribution. Does that make sense? This is like a, and so like, it's like trivial to estimate, right? Hopefully you see that. It's like, you just run the first stage, you look at the coefficient, then you say, all right, run the first stage for men, get the coefficient, compare the ratio of those two. That'll tell you how much more men are in the complier group versus say, um, uh, in the overall population. Finally, this um, uh, uh, Alberto Abadi's 2002 JASA paper shows how to construct, construct the potential outcomes for the compliers. So this is pretty cool. So um, basically let G be any measurable function. I don't know. I can't off the top of my head think of non-measurable functions that you guys would be interested in. You can basically show, or so this is what he shows, is that say you have some function here, g, that the mean of that function value for the compliers can be written, can be estimated using the observed data. So what this is saying is that you can look at the potential outcome, the average outcome in the treated case versus the average outcome for the untreated case. So I hope that's clear why that's cool, right? So like, this is literally the counterfactual value for the compliers. You can say, all right, well, what is the mean amongst the compliers? What does it mean for those who wouldn't have been treated or who, who when conditional on them being treated? And then what is the value for them conditional on not having been treated? So these are just means and you would just be rescaling them. This can be generalized into what he calls, this is called the Abadi Kappa. But all you do is you basically are gonna take, um, so to make this simple, imagine G is just the identity function. So all you wanted was the, the, the mean for the, in the, the marginal of the treatment and the mean for the marginal of the untreat, the, the non-treated. Well, what you do is you take the treated value times the outcome multiply those two together, take the conditional expectation given the zi equals one, take the difference for zi equals zero, and then scale by the propensity score. That's gonna give you the average um, outcome, potential outcome for the compliers. Now, right, the difference between the two of these is just the treatment effect. So it's not that interesting, it's just giving you the, the underlying marginal. But what's cool, and I'm gonna show you a graph in just a second, is that What's much more powerful is you can actually talk about 
the distributional impact. So what the distribution looks like for these by using exactly this approach. So what you could say is, all right, well, what I care about is what does the underlying distribution look like for the compliers? So the distribution under the treatment, so this is the, this is the marginal, the cumulative distribution for of the marginal under the treatment regime. Well, that's an indicator function for the pro it's basically the right, it's the probability that yi1 is less than y for the compliers. And we can literally then what we're just saying is the function is this indicator function. We'd, that would be this g. And so we can estimate it for every value of y for the under the treatment. And we can do it for under the control. And I'm going to show you what this looks like. So you can see kind of how this would how this would work well. So imagine we're doing veterans again, but now instead of mortality, we're looking at their lifetime earnings or their earnings. I think it's like 20 years later. Um, I forget exactly how many years later. Um, on the y-axis, we have their annual earnings. So this is the cumulative distribution function. So it goes all the way up to one annual earnings. And this is the OLS comparison. So this is just saying veterans versus non-veterans. This would be, if we took the difference between these two, that would be kind of like the biased difference between the two of them. It's not very interesting. Empirical distributions of earnings for veterans and non-veterans. Here's the complier distributions that come from doing exactly that process that we talked about. So what we did was, so you take every, you take a given value of Y, you construct that indicator function and you do it for um, the compliers who are, untreated versus the compliers who are treated. And you can see then exactly the marginal distribution under the two of them. And you can actually talk about, well, where is the benefit coming from in the distribution? Which is kind of awesome, right? Because I mean, this is amazing. You can kind of see exactly, well, the difference between these, those are going to be the treatment effects at different parts of the quantiles. And what you start to see, which maybe you wouldn't expect, is that those, the upper part of the distribution is not moved by veteran status, right? It's really about um, moving kind of, there's this shift in the distribution um, at the bottom and the top part of um, the income distribution. So the non-veterans, right? They have sort of this substantially different distribution in what their incomes look like. So I guess actually I'm, I'm, I'm misstating the way that it works. It's kind of, the earnings distribution is more bad for the non-veterans here. So there's, right, there's more people who have um, high income for the non-veterans than for the, um, for the veterans. So this is kind of the things you can learn a lot about the compliers relative. Now, we can't do this for anyone other than the compliers, but we can know a lot of average characteristics about the compliers we can know how many of them there are, and we can know a lot about their underlying um, marginal distributions. And I went, sorry, I went a couple minutes over. I'm going to stop there. If anyone has any questions, I'll stick around. Otherwise, I'll see you all on Thursday.